Good morning, good morning, good morning. God bless you. We're excited for what God's about to do here at Relevant Church and right where you are in your home. God is doing something amazing already. I can feel it stirring up in this place that's already stirring up on the inside of me. So I just know that it's going to bless your life. We're excited about that. We're excited about the fact that you have logged on. I pray that you were blessed by the Thanksgiving service. I mean, listen. It was a blessing unto me. I've gone back and watched. I've gone back and listened. God truly poured out um, as we came together virtually on Thanksgiving. We pray that your family was blessed. We pray that you guys experienced a great Thanksgiving. Even if you had a rough Thanksgiving, God is still faithful. He sees us through the ups. He sees us through the downs. And he continues to lead us and guide us right to the destiny that he has for us. So I'm excited for what he is doing in your life, no matter what it looks like because mature folks in Christ can trust him even when it don't look like what we love. We love him even when our life don't look like what we love. And so I'm excited that we are mature enough to understand that. And so we, this morning, I really want to pray for you. I mean, that's the, that's the heavy thing upon my heart is I want you to go ahead and drop some prayer requests even if you want to send it to us directly, um, if you're saying, I don't want to share this online, I get that. And you want to send us an email or send us a message, but we want to pray for you. One thing that the church does is pray. And we're not a ministry that just says we're praying for you and we don't pray for you. I need you to understand that we have a prayer list, an actual list that we pray for you every day. And we want to make sure that you're on that list if you need prayer. And so we want to lift you up. And I want you to, I want you to really get this today, is that sometimes the Lord allows you to cross paths with people and you overhear things and you just thought it was the gift of being nosy. Amen. But it's not just the gift of being nosy. It's the fact of hearing things so that you can bring them to the Lord. And sometimes you hear things so that you can let us know so we can pray for a situation. We pray for court situations. We pray for healings. We pray for deliverance. We pray for grandchildren. We pray for adults. We pray for young children. We pray for school systems. We pray for teachers. We pray for first responders. We pray for people who are in offices. We pray for people who are serving out in the road. We pray for people who are working on the road. We pray for, we pray for everybody. There's nothing too big, nothing too small. We pray for people who are applying to colleges. We pray for people who are going through financial situations. We pray for people who are going through different ups and downs in their life and going through treatments and different. And we have testimonies in so many different areas, not because of us, but because of him. And so we, we come and promise you that we'll lift them up in prayer. We promise you that we'll lift them up in prayer. And so we just ask that you take the time to either just drop a name, say, hey, pray for this person, pray for this school district, pray for whatever. And, and the other thing about prayer is that when you do that, sometimes as we are praying, God begins to activate our hands and says, show up for them in this way. And then we're able to show up for them with our hands, but we start in the spirit. Oh, this is not preaching time, but I really want you to understand that God has us show up with our hands after we've shown up in the spirit. Faith without works is dead. You can't separate either one of them. So we show up in the spirit first and the Lord shows us what to do with our hands. You need both of them, but you can't just go work with your hands without direction from God who says, this is how I want you to work with your hands. And you can't just pray in the spirit. And he says to activate your hands. And you say, no, I just want to stay right here. So we pray to God. He speaks to our heart. We activate our hands and we go serve. So maybe what God has allowed you to overhear is a prayer request that we can lift up today. And so we want to do that. We thank you as those are showing up in the chat um, on YouTube and Facebook and those different things and emails are coming through. We want to make sure that we are covering those who we need to cover. I love God because he, <laughs> he has a whole lot of long distance. There is nothing out of his reach, nothing out of his range. He never roams. Amen. He is everywhere with all his bars to be able to reach, serve, and touch the lives of whoever he needs to. Amen. So as they roll in, let us pray. Father, we thank you. 
and we bless your name for those who are coming in the room now and, and, and extending their prayer requests. God, you know what they need. You know who they are. You know where they are. You know what they need. You know the true root behind what they're going through. So Lord, let your will be done in their life. Protect them, keep them, sustain them, heal them, deliver them, cause them to have confidence, endurance, strength, wisdom, peace, a sound mind now in the name of Jesus. We call them blessed. We call them whole. We call them strong. We call them confidence. We call them courageous now in the name of Jesus. We speak to their spirit and we say, become alive on the inside of you now in the name of Jesus. You shall not die, but you shall live. Come alive now in the name of Jesus. Let your Holy Spirit just rain down on them. And I thank you, God, that you're putting angels all around them to protect them now in the name of Jesus, that they will not suffer hurt, harm, or danger, God, in the cycles that they've been going around in, God, that you're showing them a way to break that destructive, destructive cycle, that they been move with the power of God into what you call them to now in the name of Jesus. And more importantly, Lord, I thank you, God, that you're directing their heart more towards you. Let their ways become your ways. Let their thoughts become your thoughts. Break, your, break their hearts for the things that break your heart, God, that they may have compassion and empathy for those who they come across. So, Lord, we thank you for all these things. We call them blessed. We call them healthy. We call them whole. We call them strong. We call them protected and built up in the most holy faith. In Jesus name we pray. Amen. God is good. Can we bless the Lord like it's done? Can we bless the Lord like it's done? God's a great God. He's a mighty God and he truly does all things well. And so we're excited for what God is doing. We're, we're thankful for the ability to be able to pray for you today and we will follow up with you. Continue to follow up with us so that we can understand and know how to better pray for those in your life. Listen, we're getting ready to go into the word of God. We're excited about the word. We want for you to stay with us until the end. When you stay, there's something powerful that happens when you listen from beginning to the end. It ain't that long. I'll preach that long. I promise. So you want to stay with us from beginning to the end. We want you to create a space to where you can focus. See, people, they, they don't really understand the power of preparation. The fact that you just create a space. Move the papers out of the way. Do something different. Create a space to where you can hear him. And then we want you to save this message as it blesses your life. And we want you to share this message with somebody else right now, whether you're tagging them or, or sending them a text or whatever you need to do, share this message with somebody. You never know what this message may do for them in this moment. It's not too late. Yeah, they might've missed the first part, but they can go back and watch it. Here's the part. God has called you to spread the good news. What easier way than it is to send a text press share, tag somebody in the comments. God is doing great things. We're excited. We're getting ready to go into the message. Third week of the spectacle series. Thought I was going to tell you what the title was. You're going to have to watch. Let's go into the message. Amen, amen, amen. Bless the Lord on this Sunday morning. I'm excited for what God's about to do up in this place today. I know you might be saying I'm not in the place, but you might be in your room, but I'm excited for what God's gonna do in your room. I'm excited for what God's gonna do in your car. I'm excited for what God's gonna do in your kitchen right now. I'm excited for what God's gonna do in your life because wherever you are, God is there showing up strong. And if you would just allow yourself to let go for a moment, I promise he will show up in your space right now and just give him a praise. Put your hands together. Together, lift him up, glorify him, throw some hearts in the chat, throw some hands up in the chat, whatever you need to do to give God a praise and honor him today. You may not be able to actually do the things that I said. Maybe your limbs don't work the way you would like for them to work, but it's about centering your mind and giving your body and giving your focus to him. And that's what he wants. And we lift our voice to him. Whatever we got to give him, we give it to him today. And we bless his holy and righteous name. God is good, ain't he? God is so good. He's a faithful God. He's just He's true. He's mighty. He is all that we need and more. He's a constant friend. I know him to be a deliverer. I know him to be a friend. I know him to be a healer. I know him to be a way maker. I know him to be a promise keeper. I know him to be all that he said he would be and more. I know him to be true to his word. And I just praise him today for he's a great God. He's a mighty God. Can we bless him together? Put those hands together and lift up a hallelujah to our king. For he is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. There's none like him in all the earth. He's a great God. He's a mighty God. Regular folk look at their situation and judge whether or not they should praise. Mature folk say, this is the day the Lord has made. I shall rejoice and be glad in it. Immature people try to look and say, God, I need this. I need that. 
mature people say, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And I believe we got some mature folk on the line today that realize today is the day I will bless the Lord. I will rejoice without ceasing. Amen. I will pray without ceasing. In all things, I'm going to give him thanks. And so we're excited for what God's about to do. Amen. We're going into the word of God today. We're continuing the third week of our spectacle series. Today, we're going into Luke chapter 15, verse 20 through 24. That's Luke chapter 15, verses 20 through 24. I pray that you had a great Thanksgiving. Even if you didn't, God is still faithful. If you did, bless God for the opportunity to have a Thanksgiving. That's great. What I found in life, we have some ups, we have some downs. We have some easy times. We have some trying times. We have some hills. We have some valleys. But I know that God is constant through them all. So if you had a good time, we celebrate with you. If you had a rough time, we mourn with you. If you had some great gains, we bless the Lord. If you had some times of grief, we grieve with you. And we just want you to know that God is faithful through it all. Amen. And we're just excited that God has a way of seeing us through even the most tough times and turning things around, even when we don't see a way. Amen. We're going to Luke chapter 15, verse 20 through 24. It goes like this. It says, so the son left and went to his father. And while the son was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt sorry for his son. So the father ran to him and hugged him and kissed him. 21. The son said, Father, I have sinned against God and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Verse 22. But the father said to his servants, hurry, bring the best clothes and put it on him. Also put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Verse 23. And get our fat calf and kill it so we can have a feast and celebrate. Verse 24. My son was dead. But now he is alive again. He was lost, but now he is found. So they begin to celebrate. We're going into the third week of the spectacle series. And we're talking about today. How do you see God? How do you see God? The overarching theme of this spectacle series is what you see is what you get. The specific question today is how do you see God? Can we pray together? Lord, we thank you. We bless your name for the great things that you have done. We thank you for this word that we're about to receive. We thank you for the opportunity to preach this word. We thank you for the opportunity to receive this word. What I have found in life is that moments are to be cherished. Moments are meant to be maximized and moments are supposed to be where you are present. So Lord, make us fully present in this moment. Let us not just think it's another word that's preached. Let us not think it's just another service. Let us not think it's just another another thing. But let us be present in this moment because this moment will not come to us again. But Lord, let us receive well, listen well, and adjust our lives to be fine-tuned to what you want us to be. We thank you for all this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 How do you see God? It's interesting as we talk about this, this spectacle series, because what you see is truly what you get. How you approach different venues, how you approach different people, how you approach, you know, different things in your life is what you get out of it. I could have a vase that I have that's been specially designed for flowers to hold them a certain way so they don't get tipped over and that kind of thing. But if I never see it the way it was created as a vase, I may see it as a bucket. And the only thing that I do with it is carry water from one place to the next. I could see someone as simply a cook, which is a great thing. I could see them as a cook and my perspective of them is a cook. But I will never experience their architecture and and how they're able to create different things the way that, that God may have birthed and gifted them. Because I only see them as a cook. I may hear about their giftings and different things that they pursue. But if I only see them as a cook, I'll only go to them for cooking. Other people may be experiencing an overwhelming uh, 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 influx of, of blessings when it comes to their design and their architecture. But if I only see them as a cook, 
I will only go to them when I want food or advice on a recipe because I only see them that way. My perspective from where I sit, this is how I see them. In my own personal life, there are many perspectives that you may have for me. You may see me as an educator, so you only come to me and, and, and I'm, I am uh, a secularly, uh, secular, I guess is the word, trained in music. So you may only come to me for my degree that I have in music and may not understand that you could get more if you came to me as pastor. You may only see me as a father, so you come to me for, for parenting advice because you see us raising two boys, but you may not see me as an educator. You may not see me as a pastor, so you only get the perspective that you see. You may see me as help to paint something. Lord, I hope you don't see me as that. But you may see me as help to help you paint your house or whatever. You only come to me to ask me to paint something for you, but you miss the fact of the other perspective. It's not the fact that I'm limited in either area. It's the fact that you get what you see. What you see is what you get. And when you come to me for a specific thing, that's all you can get. It's always a trip that we talk about. I remember a pastor told me, he said, he said, how you approach me is what you get. When you call me pastor such and such, you get pastor such and such. When you call me Mr. Such and such, you get Mr. Such and such. When you call me my nickname from back in the day, you get that person from back in the day. And depending on what you want is how you come to me and you ask me for different things and different things go off in my head by how you approach me. When somebody calls me Mr. Patrick, one person comes to the forefront. When somebody calls me Pastor Pete, another person comes to the forefront. When somebody calls me Daddy, another person comes to the forefront. When somebody calls me Patrick, something else comes to the forefront. Depending on what you see is depending on what you're going to get because that's how you approach us. I approach Bishop Eugene Reeves as Bishop Eugene Reeves. I approach Apostle Stephen as Apostle Stephen. I approach these people and I acknowledge them in that light because that's my perspective of them and that's who I need to show up in my life. So I approach them that way with that honor, with that gratitude, because I understand that what you see is what you get. And so when we look at this, it brings us to this text because perspective will cause you to act a certain way. Perspective will cause you to move a certain way. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. As a man truly receives and has, and he lives out his perspective. Because his perspective calls his hearts to believe and he begins to act out of that perspective. And so we find here this well-known passage of the, of the prodigal son that many people know. And it is written by Luke, who was a physician and he was friends with Paul. And, and we see that we have this, this physician that's writing who, as a physician, he deals with humanity. A lot. He deals with sickness. He deals with all these different things. He deals with humanity. So we find him when he writes his his gospel. We see him dealing with the humanity of Christ. Many times he brings us a picture of what it's like as Jesus to be fully God and fully man for we can understand the human characteristics and apply it to our life and see how God may handle us or how he may approach us. And this is what we see over and over in the gospel of Luke. And so he has hands on experience with humanity. And we see this theme all the way through the gospel account, according to Luke. Which makes sense of why he would bring such a story this way of a man and his two sons. That we can see the humanity of what a father would feel towards two sons in this situation. And today I just want to highlight one of them. We have so much to talk about in this passage, but we're going to highlight one of them. And this son who asks for the portion of goods that fall up unto him. And he goes out and he goes and spends it doing whatever he wants to do, living the life that he wants to live. And the Bible calls it riotous living that he goes out and begins to waste his inheritance, what he has received from the father that he asked for, but he begins to waste it. 
I know we've made prodigal son such a dirty and, and, and such a, a shameful term, but prodigal just simply means wasteful, that he went out and wasted what God has given him. And we all have been guilty of wasting what God has given us in one way, shape or form that God has blessed us sometimes with opportunities that we wasted. God has blessed us with family sometimes that we wasted. God has blessed us with some connection sometimes that we wasted. God has blessed us with a gift inside of us sometimes that we wasted. So we all can relate a little bit about wasting. Some of us still got leftovers that we probably going to waste from Thanksgiving. And so that's what we find here is that he went out and he wasted this money. But I want to ask you something. I want to ask you, how do you see God? Because this is a perfect passage to, to talk to us about how we see God. And I want to ask you this question is, do you see God as provision? Do you see God as provision? I want to, I want to look at this because the prodigal son said to the father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. Give me the goods that falleth to me. This lets me know when he saw the father, he saw provision. He saw a resource. He saw abundance. He saw his inheritance. He saw what he was entitled to. He saw the father's capability. He saw the father's strength and wealth. He saw the father having more than enough, which is a great way to see your father. And I pray that my son see me that way, that I have an abundance more than enough to spare for me, Carmelita, them, everybody else, that we're able to bless those who are coming into our life. And I want them to see me with abundance. But my question is, do you see him as provision? Because when you solely see someone as provision, you begin to get their wealth on the forefront of your mind rather than the relationship with them. Sometimes we see God as the answer to our prayers rather than the person to pray to to get direction. I'm going to say it again. Sometimes we see God as the answer to our prayers rather than the person who we pray to to get directions in our life. Sometimes we, we go to God because we want what we want. Sometimes we go to God because we want the answer that we want. Sometimes we go to God with a to-do to -do list and say, Lord, show up for me like this. Sometimes we come to God already with our agenda that we want to hang on his wall and say, when you get done doing what you need to do with everybody else, can you please handle this too? As if God works for us. Sometimes we see the resource that he has and we go to him for the resource rather than going to him for him. Oh, this is good preaching today. Is that we got to realize that God is more than what he can provide. God is more than his hand. God is more than what he can extend to us. God is more than a healer. God is more than a deliverer. These are the things that he has, but it's more to what he is than those things. And if we start seeking him for those things and we miss the God who has those things and it will be a byproduct of your relationship with him. When we start seeking him for the things, we move from being disciples to the multitude. I'm going to say that again. When we start seeking him for things, we move from being disciples to the multitude. The multitude showed up when he was feeding people. The multitude showed up when he was healing people. The multitude showed up when he was doing miracles. The multitude showed up just to hear and speak. The multitude showed up for all these reasons, but it was the disciples who came for direction. It was the disciples who came for correction. It was the disciples who laid down their life to follow him. It was the disciples. So my question is, are you a disciple or are you in the multitude? Because the multitude just shows up to get what they can get and then go on the way that they want to go. The multitude don't get a name. The multitude doesn't get an identity. The multitude is just the abundance of people who got their hands out for a miracle. When we start seeking God for the miracle more than for who he is, we miss an opportunity to be in an intimate relationship with him. How do you see God? Do you see him as provision? So what, Pastor P? I ain't supposed to pray to God. Yeah, yes, pray to God. But when you go to God, go in humbly asking him for direction. Let him be able to correct you. Let him be able to guide you. Let him be able to show you the way that you should go. Go into his presence with thanksgiving, into his courts with praise, that you will go to him so he can direct your path. Rather than going to him with a path that you want him to bless. Rather than going him with these plans that you want him to sign off on. 
rather than going to him with all these different things that we want for ourselves and we want him to be okay with. Lord, no. What do you want me to have? I belong to you. Show me how to show up for your people. We talked about this one time in the message where we started talking about God's kingdom. And it's really amazing to me how Chick-fil-A begins to line up along with how the kingdom of God works. You might be saying, Pastor P, Chick-fil-A, what, how, how does that work? Because Chick-fil-A doesn't have owners, they have operators. And in, in Chick-fil-A, the operator is in connection with headquarters and headquarters decides what the real estate is going to be. They buy the real estate, they, they get the building straight, they put the equipment in the building and they're communicating with the operator so the operator can do what headquarters wants it to do. And then the operator doesn't own anything that the store has. The operator, when something goes wrong, follows the principles and precepts that headquarters said. And if something really goes, he ain't communicate back with headquarters and headquarters take care of it because it don't belong to the operator. The operator is just governing what is already there. He is an operation of the kingdom that's being extended from headquarters, which is Chick-fil-A corporate, and it's showing up in this area so that these people can be affected with great chicken and great service, and that the atmosphere and the culture that they bring could come in and intrude in this area and begin to influence this area so much so that other restaurants are saying, my pleasure. So what are you saying, Pastor Pete? I'm saying is that when we see God in relationship with him, rather than just, I want you to do what I want to do. No, I come in as an operator the same way at Chick-fil-A and say, look, where do you want to put the real estate? What style building do you want? What equipment do you need to use? Who should I hire? How should we do this? Even though I don't want to say my pleasure, I say my pleasure. Even though I don't want to forgive him, I forgive him. Even though I don't want to serve him, I serve him. Even though I want, it doesn't matter what I want because I don't own none of this. I'm just operating what you have. And so I approach you that way. I don't go to headquarters with my plan. I come into headquarters to get a plan and then I go back out and I serve so that I can impact my area with my influence for the kingdom of God. And they will say my pleasure because they've had an interaction, even though they never walked on the top floor at headquarters, they get what headquarters wants here in this area because I'm submitted. And I realize that I don't own this. I'm just operating in the authority that he's given me. And so when we see that, we move from seeing God as just provision, but we see him in a different light. Do you see him as provision? Do you see him as just a resource? Do you see him as what he can give to you? Or do you see him as more than that? And I don't want a quick answer that says, oh, I just see him. Yes, I see him more than that. But the question is, I can tell how you see me, how you approach me. I can tell how you see me by how you handle me. I can tell how you see me by what you ask me for. I can tell how you see me by what you count on me for. I can tell how you see me by what you're willing to be vulnerable with. See, people who see me as a music educator are truly okay with being vulnerable to the fact that they don't understand music and want me to teach them. But if you, if you see me, if you say you see me as a pastor, but you're not willing to be vulnerable with the advice and the words that God gives me for you, then you truly don't see me as that. That's just lip service. Because what you see is what you get and how you approach someone is how you see them. I don't want to go into my doctor's office going to get my line up straight because I don't see him as that. He might cut hair on the side, but I don't go in expecting a haircut because I don't see him that way. Michael Jordan could have been a great pilot. I don't know, but I don't see him that way. So I don't approach him that way. I approach him as a ball player because that's how I see him. He could, he could have some other things that he's great at. I don't know that. I don't see him that way because what I see is what I get. And my question for you today is, how do you see God? What do you get from him? How do you see him? I want to bring in the fact 
of this question is, do you see God as a judge? Do you see God as a judge? I want to read here in verse 20. So the son left and went to his father. And while the son was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt sorry for his son. So the father ran to him and hugged and kissed him. The son said, Father, I have sinned against God and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. The son has already disqualified himself based on the fact of his actions and his motives and what he has done uh, coming back to the house. He, he begins to question and begins to disqualify himself from sonship based on what he has done. As the father is a judge. Based on my actions, I should have this sentence. Based on what I've done, this should happen to me. Based on the actions of my hand, I am qualified to have this in my life. And I'm disqualified to have this in my life based on what I've done. You see, when you got to go to court and you got to stand before a judge, it's not a warm and fuzzy feeling on the inside as you approach the stand. You do not approach the judge in your most vulnerable place willingly. You go in very hesitant. You go in hoping and wishing. You go in maybe praying. You go in hoping. You go in expecting for something to be done based on what you've done. If you're innocent, you go in humbly hoping and wishing and expecting that you, your innocence is proven and it comes to light. However, if you see him as a judge, you don't also trust him with your life, so to speak, because you really hope that the truth will convince him. But you're still not sure. When you see him as a judge and you're guilty, you're hoping that there's some type of mercy that will be extended your way. You're going in very hesitant because you really don't want to be there because you know what you did was wrong. And you also understand that your action should have this type of consequence. But you're hoping there's some kind of way that something changes on your behalf. Either way, when you see the judge as a judge, you don't go in like, hey, judge, how you doing? I'm glad to see you. Look, we go. No, there's not that type of relationship. You're hoping that some type of way that you either don't get what you deserve or that you hope that the truth shows that you should be set free. In both scenarios, when you see him as a judge, you begin to qualify or disqualify yourself based on your actions. I'm going to say that again. When you see him as a judge, you begin to qualify or disqualify yourself based on your actions. The problem is, if we see God as a judge, then we begin to qualify or disqualify ourselves based on our actions. So what's the problem with that, Pastor P? Because we are judged not by our actions, but by our belief. Oh, come on. Our actions do have consequence, but our actions have consequence because of the principles that we break, not because of the God who wants to enforce harm and harshness on us. When God establishes a principle in the earth, when you break said principle, there's automatically consequences that show up with it. Not because God has to come back and punish you, Somebody is like, oh, well, I'm going to break the law. And no, the law broke you. Because when you when you when you begin to uh, uh, break or, or, or uh, violate the principle, the principle breaks you. If you jump off the building and the law of gravity is in effect as it is and you hit the ground, you did not break the law of gravity. The law of gravity broke you. You go out here and you destroy your body with drinking or, and, and not eating healthy and living a lifestyle that's contrary to what God has called us to live. Your body will deteriorate, not because you broke the law, because the law broke you. You go out here and decide that you're not going to drink no water. You decide that you go out here that you're going to eat salty foods all the time. You decide that you go out here and you're just going to live a life that's totally contrary to what God has called you to live in a healthy aspect and your life and your body begins to deteriorate. God didn't do that to you. You violated the law that he has set up as concerning your body. But if we see God as a judge, we begin to validate the things that come into our life as he's judging us. 
Let me tell you something. If God begins to judge you, there will be nothing left. Nothing left. Because when we talk about his standard and we begin to talk about his holiness and we begin to talk about what he is and how great and perfect he is, there is no way that any point in time that our deeds can qualify ourselves to be just as him. That's why Jesus had to come. Even on your best day, the Bible says our righteousness is as filthy rags. Look that up and figure out what that is. A used Tampax Pearl if you need to know for the quick notes. He says that on your best day, your righteousness measures up to that. So when I begin to qualify or disqualify myself based on my actions, I'm seeing God as a judge, not as one who has sent the sacrificial lamb for me in, the, in, the, in Jesus Christ to die on the cross for my sin. That if I believe in him, that he will wash me clean and he'll see me through the blood of Jesus Christ and begin to accept me for I'm the righteousness of God. I'm the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. The righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. So when I find myself in Christ, then I become the righteousness of God. When I find myself outside of Christ, my righteousness is as filthy rags. So when I begin to qualify or disqualify myself based on my actions, I see him as a judge. But isn't he a judge, Pastor P? Won't he, ju- won't he do all these things? Doesn't he? Isn't he a righteous judge? Yeah. He has these aspects within him. But when I see him as a judge, what I see is what I get. When I see him in that light, I approach him that way. Let me tell you something. That the judge that sits up and judges your case in the natural also has sons and may have daughters and may have grandchildren. Is he a judge? Yes, he is. Is he a judge to them? He judges things in their life, but they approach him differently. That when his son comes up to him, yes, he is a judge, but I'm his father. When his daughter runs up to him and jumps in his arm, yes, I am a judge. My my credentials are still here. My gavel is still on my desk. I still have the power as a judge, but you, my daughter. Same person, same man, different perspective. So if I only see you as a judge, key word, only see you as a judge. I will, I'm going to approach you different because that's how I see you. Do you see God as a judge? Because if you see him as a judge, you begin to qualify or disqualify yourself based on your actions. And then you be trying to measure up to what he wants you to be based on what you've done. And God never called us to do that. That's why he sent Jesus to die for us so that we could be washed clean. And yes, does he want you to obey? He does. And yes, does he want you to be obedient? Yes, he does. And yes, does he want you to deny yourself? Yes, he does. But I'm so glad that grace and mercy continues to wash me clean even when I miss it. That in pursuit of being who God has called me to be, there's some ups and some downs. There's some times when I fall. There's some times when I scrape my knee. There's some times when I miss it. There's some times when I don't understand fully. There's some times when I totally understand and decide to do something different. There's some times when he has to correct me. There's some times when he has to look at me and say, this is not the right way to go. There's some times when he has to correct me. And and there's some time where he has to chastise me. There's some times when he has to put his hands on me and say, I would need for you to go this way. There's some times that are uncomfortable. But if I see him as a judge, I'll see it as a sentence rather than something that's helping me get to my destiny, rather than something that's causing me to flourish, rather than something that's causing me to prosper, rather than something that's causing me to move forward, rather than something that's causing me to be an overcomer, rather than something that's causing me to win this battle. Even though it don't feel good, it's pushing me towards my purpose for a good, for the steps of a good man are ordered of the Lord, that he's working these things out for my good. And even though the weapon is forming, it's not going to prosper. He has me right where he wants me to be. And when I see him that way, I get him that way. But if I see him as a judge, I see it as a sentence rather than an opportunity to develop. Do you see him as a judge?
How do I know if I see him as a judge? If you judge your life based off of what you did and don't do. When you try to qualify your Christianity based on what you did. Or you feel disqualified from your destiny based on what you did. Because God says it like this, that the gifts and callings of God are without repentance. And he says, I don't judge my gifting in you based off of what you did. I don't qualify you or disqualify you based on your actions. I qualify you based on the fact that I called you. And before you were formed in your mother's womb, I knew you and ordained you to be dot, dot, dot. And therefore, I'm not going to change my mind about you. I'm going to bring you to where you need to be. And I'm going to continue to guide you to where you need to go. And when I correct you and when things don't go the way you want to, it's not a sentence. It's a guiding to the destination. It's a journey. So the question becomes, do you see him as a father? Do you see God as a father? I want to highlight something here in 22. But the father said to his servants, hurry, bring the best clothes and put them on him. Also put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Verse 23, and get our fat calf and kill it so we can have a feast and celebrate. My son, somebody say my son, was dead, but now he is alive again. My son was dead, but now he's alive again. He was lost, but now he is found. So they begin to celebrate. I want you to understand here is that the son disqualified himself based off his actions. The father never stopped being his father, but it was how the son saw the father that caused him to act and say the things that he did. I need you to understand that he says that my son was dead, but now he is alive again. He was lost, but now he is found. So they begin to celebrate. I really want you to see the fact is that when he came, he said, I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father saw him afar off and went to kiss him. But the son said, I'm no longer to be worthy to be called your son. The father comes back and says, go kill the fatted calf. My son was dead, but now he's alive again. Wait a minute. The son never died. He was still alive the whole time, even while he was wasting what he was wasting. And even when he came back, he said, what do you mean he was dead? He was saying the fact that, listen, my son didn't realize his sonship, but his sonship is alive again. <laughs> my son didn't realize who he was, but he realizes who he is now. My son was acting as though he was a servant, but now his belief system is coming back to him. And as his belief system comes back to him, there is so much more that's birthing on the inside that it's time to celebrate. It ain't so much that you spent the money. It was the fact that your mindset said you want a son no more. And when your mindset say you're not a son no more, then you don't live like a son. You don't walk like a son. You don't carry yourself like a son. You don't move like a son. You don't have the confidence that a son has. You don't have that, 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 that swagger to you that says, listen, I'm supposed to be here. You come in timid. You come in quiet. You come in below. You become in beneath. But when you realize you're a son, you begin to stand up and say, yes, my, my father might correct me, but I'm a son. They might tell me to go a different way, but I'm a son. I might not have everything that I want to have in my own hands, but I'm a son. I may have to correct myself and go through a different way, but I'm still a son. My father may yell at me, but I'm still a son. My father may correct me, but I'm still a son. My father may caused me to do things differently, but I'm still a son. And in my, even though I make mistakes, I'm still a son. That there's nothing that can separate me from his love because I'm a son. And when we realize our sonship, there's something that rises up on the inside. And when I see you as a father, I realize that your connection, your correction is not a sentence, but it's a connection to my destiny. I'm going to say that again. When I see you as a father, I realize that my correction is not a sentence, but it's correction to the direction of my destiny. And I understand that as you correct me, it is through love. As you correct me, it is pointing me towards destiny. As you chastise me, it is because you love me. See, the true aspect of sonship is that I can tell you something that you don't like, but yet you still say. When the multitude left, the multitude was good as long as Jesus was saying what they wanted him to hear. But those who were truly his sons stayed around when he started talking about the cross. Those who were truly his sons stayed around when he started saying things they didn't like. When those who were truly his sons stayed around when he began to say things that were harsh. When he begins to correct people. When he begins to rebuke them. They stayed around. That's true sonship when you can stay around and still be corrected. 
Because as soon as you say something that somebody doesn't like, if they're not a son, if they're not truly connected, they're going to leave. And that's how you know they're the multitude. Because sonship will take the whooping and stay in the house. Oh, come on. Sonship will take the correction and say, how can I help? Sonship will believe even when they don't understand. Sonship will become activated at the word of the father. Sonship doesn't have to worry about the resources because relationship is where the resources flow. I ain't got to worry about making a plate because I live here. Oh, come on. I don't got to worry about running out because I know my father has more than enough for me. I don't have to act like this is my last meal because I'm coming back tomorrow. You don't got to knock when you got a key. You can just roll in. You can open up the door and get open up the refrigerator. And still I still got a key to my daddy's house and I'm grown because I can walk in. I'm a son. Come on, y'all. That we can walk in because of our sonship. I don't have to worry about wrestling and trying to do this and do that so that I can have access. I have access because I'm a son, not because I'm perfect, but because I'm a son. Not because I do everything right, but because I'm a son. Not because I say all the right things, but because I'm a son. Not because I live a perfect life, but because I'm a son. Because I'm a son, I got access. And I walk like I got access. I talk like I got access. I will look at you strange if you think I ain't supposed to be here. If you treat me like I am not a son, I'm going to look at you strange for a second. Because I expect what comes with my sonship. I expect the benefits of my sonship. I expect the respect of my sonship because I realize I'm a son. So when God begins to deal with me, I see him as a father. And when I see him as a father, then I see him through the love that he has for me. So if his answer is no, then I know that it must be the fact that I don't need it right now or I'm not ready. If his answer is yes, then I can trust his yes because I realize that I'm ready. If his answer says wait, then I wait patiently and I serve while I wait. If his answer is the fact, yes, I want you to do this right now, then I can trust it. I need you to understand that when you see him as a father, there's something special that happens. And he says, I need for you to see me as a father because I see you as a son. The whole time through the text, the father never stopped calling him son. The son stopped calling him son. Through the whole text, the son is the one who changes and begins to call himself a servant, but the father never stops calling him son. And I love the aspect of a father because the father sees when his sonship turns back on. I don't know if it was the fatty calf. I don't know if it was the ring. I don't know if it was the sandals. I don't know if it was the hug. I don't know if it was the kiss. I don't know if it was the fact that the father was waiting for him. I don't know if it was the fact that the father ran to him. I don't know if it's the fact that he called and began to throw a party for him. I don't know when his sonship turned back on, but at some point his sonship turned back on and the father saw it in him. And when the father saw the sonship turn on, he said, it's time to celebrate. I'm waiting for God to say, it's time to celebrate for you when your sonship turns back on. You thought serving at church was what God wanted you to do. That's a good thing, but he wants your sonship to turn back on. You thought it was giving your money to the church is what God wants you to do. That's a good thing, but he wants your sonship to turn back on. You thought going to that job and going to these different things was what he wants you to do, but he really wants that sonship to turn back on because through that sonship, all those other things should flow. He wants you to realize, hey, you a son, you a daughter. You don't have to live perfect. You just got to realize who you are. You don't have to do everything just right. You got to realize who you are. When you realize your sonship, you move different. When you realize your sonship, you talk different. When you realize who you belong to, you stand tall. When you realize who you connected to, there's something that will birth out of you. I need for somebody's sonship to turn back on because you've been living like you a servant and God calls you a son. He wants you to rise up and walk bold because when I see him as a father, I have no choice but to see me as a son. 
When I see him as a father, I have no choice but to see me as a son. And it's time for you to live like royalty. It's time for you to rise up and say, I'm a holy generation, a royal priesthood, a peculiar people. That I'm in this world, but I'm not of it. I'm different. I'm different. Y'all about to see something flow through me that's going to impact this whole area around me. Chick-fil-A comes into an area and folks who were saying, oh, here, whatever. Hey, go ahead. When you pull up to the little thing is now saying my pleasure. Why? Because Chick-fil-A came in, infiltrated, showed up, brought the principals from their headquarters to that area and used their influence through some chicken sandwiches to impact the whole culture and industry because they were true to what headquarters said. God is about to take what's inside of you. If he can use chicken, he can use your art. If he can use chicken, he can use your voice. If he can use chicken, he can use your idea. If he can use chicken, he can use your song. If he can use chicken, he can use your poetry. If he can use chicken, he can use your kids. If he can use chicken, he can use your pictures to come in and disrupt the whole area and impact the whole culture who has just been, oh, go ahead. And then they start saying, God of God, we bless your name. Lord, who is the Lord of Lords, we give your name praise. We honor you. We bless your holy and righteous name because you come in serving one thing, but you come in and interrupt a whole culture with God's principles and dynamics. They looking at your art and getting impacted by the Holy Spirit. They coming into your studio and feeling God speak to them. They coming into your hair salon and leaving changed. They're coming into your restaurant and their family comes back together. So you think it's about the thing, but it's bigger than the thing. But it's all in how you see the thing that's holding you up. It has a lot to do with how you view God. Do you view him as a father? And when you view him as a father, you realize that he gives his kids the best gift. I'm going to give you all some stuff at Christmas. But my kids, they're going to get a special gift. I'm going to honor y'all. I'm going to bless you. Amen. But not how I bless my kids. They on a different level. They in a different space because they my sons. And when we realize that the gift that God has given us, whether it's cooking, whether it's poetry, whether it's art, whether it's the idea, the song, the book, the business, we realize that since I'm a son, He didn't give me no ordinary gift. He gave me an industry shaking gift. I feel that thing. He gave me an industry shaking gift. As his son, as his child, he ain't just give me what he gave everybody else. There's something special on this. This a limited edition gift. Yeah, I know everybody else can cook, but you can't cook like me because I'm his kid. He gave me a special gift. He put some anointing on this gift. This gift right here is about to disrupt the industry. This is why when he gave it to me, he told me to subdue and have dominion. Then when he gave it to me, he told me that this ain't the same as anybody. I want you to go in and have dominion. I know that you got your thing that you've been working on, but I'm a kid. I'm a king's kid. And what he gave to me is about to shut this whole thing down. And because I, I didn't view it like that when he gave it to me, because I didn't view him as a father, I viewed him as provision. And he was just meeting the need that I had, or I viewed him as a judge. And he gave it to me based on what I qualified for. But when I see him as a father, it don't really matter what I qualify qualify for that he's able to give me the best gift and when I'm because I'm his kid he put something special on it
And when he put something special on it, I realized that when I released this thing, you never seen nothing like this before because it's a special edition. This is only for his kids. And when you treat it like it's a special edition, you're going to ride by in it. You're going to drive that thing. You're going to release that thing. You're going to launch that thing. You're going to push that thing forward. And when you set it out and you put it out, people are going to be like, oh, mine don't look like that. I can cook, but it don't look like that. I can paint, but it don't look like that. I can sing, but it don't sound like that. I can play, but it, there's something on that that's different. Yeah, my father gave it to me. My father gave it to me. My father gave it to me. And yes, it took me a while to get it straight. I had to go through some correction. I had to go through some guidance, but my, my daddy gave it to me. That's why I look different. When we see God as a father, we realize that our mistakes were just a part of our journey but it doesn't qualify or disqualify our sonship. Can we pray together? God, I thank you and I bless your name for everyone who is watching right now. Lord, I thank you that those who are in relationship with you are activating their sonship, that they realizing that they are a king's kid. And they're beginning to move like that. They begin to believe like that. They begin to dream like that. They begin to understand like that. They're beginning to filter what's happening in their life through the fact that it's a father allowing it to happen. And if a father allows for it to happen, I shouldn't even be mad because the father knows best. That you're not judging me. That I'm not just chasing your provision. But I see you as a father. You are a good, good father. And I thank you for leading me and guiding me. If you say not yet, God, I'm still here. If you say no, I'm still here. If you say yes, I trust your yes to move forward in boldness. And if you're listening right now, and you want to accept Jesus Christ into your heart to come into that sonship. You say, I I've been mad at God for what he did to me. And I thought it was him doing it to me. And I didn't realize that it was just the principles that I was not following that he had set up for me. And I knew that I was wrong when I was doing it. And I knew that I was making bad decisions. And I knew that I was making decisions that was hurting my body. And I knew I was making decisions that was hurting others. But I blamed it on God because I thought it was him doing it to me. And I come to the realization that I did it to myself. And I removed myself from him. But he's never stopped calling me his kid. He never gave up on me. I gave up on me. And today I come back to him. And I say, I'm sorry, Lord. I repent, God. It was me who removed me. You never stopped loving me. I feel that thing. So today I want you to come back to him. I want you to start today. Start on the finish. The start on the start line of a journey that's beginning for you. That is a perspective of seeing him as a father. And not just as your provision or as a judge. And I want you to pray this prayer. And it says this, dear Jesus, come into my heart and save me. I believe that you died on the cross for my sin. And I accept you into my heart. I renounce Satan, make my salvation real to me, and lead me by your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name. And Lord, I thank you for those who have prayed that prayer. I thank you for those who need healing in their body. I thank you for those who need deliverance. God, whatever they need, you're a good, good father. We release it upon them for any earthly thing that is standing in the way of them receiving everything you have for them. We ask that it be removed now. And Lord, your perfect will be done in their life. In the name of Jesus, let their belief grow. Let their hope grow. Let their dreams grow. Now, in the name of Jesus, in Jesus' name, the church said, amen. Amen, amen, amen. Bless the Lord right there. God is good. So good. I feel I'm just moving all over. There's something special that is stirring today. Perspectives are changing. 
People are realizing something different. They're recognizing that my life that I lived is a sum of what I believed. I believed him to just be a judge. I believed him just for provision. But now I see him as a father. And when I see him as a father, everything changed. Amen. 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 Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord. Woo, y'all. He's a good, good father. And I'm excited for what God is doing in your life. If you accepted Jesus Christ into your heart today, you let God become your father. We want to hear about it. Message us, drop it in the chat, send us a message on Facebook, drop it on the chat on YouTube, text us. You can text Rel Church to 54244. You'll stay connect with us, connected with us going forward if you do that. That'd be a great way. You can text me directly. That number's popping up on the screen. You'll be able to, to talk, we'll chat it out, that kind of thing. If you want to sow into the ministry, this is a huge portion because sowing in the ministry is, is so key. Some people think it's about money, but it's not about money. It's about putting your life in the mix of what God is doing in the spirit. So when you sow into the ministry, you take what you've earned with your life and with your gift and with your talent, and you put it into what God is doing. And when you put it into what God is doing, there's a connection that happens. I almost remember every seed that I've sown in different places because I took part of my life and I left it there. And when you plant a seed, it grows where it's planted. And so we want you to sow into the ministry today if God is calling you to do so. We totally believe that God touches our hearts when it's time to give. And so we trust the fact that if God is touching your heart, then you're being obedient and you're sowing into the ministry. The ministry is good. The ministry is great. God continues to provide for his church. So I don't want you to think this is a, a gimmick after your money. No, God provides for his church. But I want you to understand that if you leave some life there, something will grow there. And when we put our life into it, we put, we put what God has blessed us to earn into it. There's something special that happens in those moments. And so I would love for you, if God is touching your heart and saying, so into this ministry, nothing's too small, nothing's too big. You can sow into the ministry and you'll see that happen in your life. Amen. So we're excited for what God is doing. We're coming back. If you're local to Matthews, you can come back into the church next week. We will be in the building, which we are excited about. We haven't been in the building in a little while. We've been outside, but we're coming back in. So please, please connect with us. Let us know that you're coming so we can make sure that we accommodate you in a great way. We're excited for what God is doing. He is doing something special. And if you're connected to us, you're one of our relevant friends. Listen, you are important to us. You show up online, you serve, you sow, you do all these different things from where you are. We're excited to have you with us. Listen. You can love us, you can rock with us, you can connect with us, you can be a part of the Relevant Church family from right where you are. Just let us know. And there are so many things you can do from where you are right there and continue to impact lives from the kingdom that you, you don't even necessarily have to come in the building to be uh, impact, to, have, to be a part of God's hands and feet. We would love for you to come in the building, but I want you to know that you are not any less important than those who come in. And so we're praying for you. Send us your prayer requests. When you're going through stuff, let us know. We'll lift you up in prayer. We want to connect with you. We would love to hop on Zoom with you sometime and have maybe some one-on-one -on -one conversations or some group. That we, there's so much we can do from where you are. So I don't want you just behind hide behind the fact that you're watching but I want you to connect because when you put your life in the mix there's something that happens and so we're excited for what God is doing look we're centered on God we're declaring his truth and living in faith he is relevant you are relevant we are relevant and together we make impact for the kingdom God bless you and we'll see you next week